Hi, everybody. Looks like attendees are starting to starting to slow down. So I'll I'll get us started. Um, so I'm Michelle Lute. I'm the Carnivore Conservation uh, Director for Project Coyote, and I'm super excited today. Thanks all for for showing up and giving us some time. I'm really excited because uh, today you have a really special treat, Dr. Francisco Santiago Avila who serves as both Project Coyote and the Rewilding Institute's um, Science and Conservation Manager, um, is gonna talk to us today about his amazing and impressive work. Uh, he started with us earlier this year and came to us from um, Dr. Adrian Travis's prestigious lab. Some of you might be familiar with some of the work coming out of University of Wisconsin-Madison and that carnivore coexistence lab. And, uh, Fran's great contributions were what first impressed us so much. And in the short time that Fran has been with the Rewilding Institute and Project Coyote, all I can say are, are great things. And we've got a chocked full presentation for you. So I don't want to take too much time. There's not really enough time in this webinar to wax as eloquently as is deserving for Fran's great work. So I am just gonna uh, let him take it over, as you know, um, maybe from Fran's recent blogs, if you follow Project Coyote's um, Notes from the Field webinar series, or not webinar, sorry, blog series, you know, Fran has a lot of great things to say about our relations with wild animals. So I'm gonna let him take it over. Thanks, Fran. Thanks, Michelle. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, buenas tardes, buenas noches a todos. I'm very excited to be here to share with you my explorations of what it means to recognize who non-human animals are and what it means to promote compassion and justice in our relationships with them within conservation and rewilding practice. Um, before, before starting on that, I'll just say that I'm presenting to you from Madison, Wisconsin. I've been here for a while. So I want to start by acknowledging that this is ancestral Ho-Chunk land and acknowledge the sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk as well as indigenous peoples everywhere. So with that said, I am going to quickly share my screen and we can get going. Okay, so um, I hope that's visible to everyone. Um, can I get a thumbs up or a, yeah, or something? Awesome. Okay, so um, welcome again. I'm gonna be talking today about um, uh, rewilding conservation and non-human values within those disciplines. So I'll do a brief signposting first. And I'm gonna start touching by touching on who non-human animals are and what they value. I will then go on to um, discuss a little bit of what's valued in traditional conservation any changes in the ethical motivations of conservation over time and who are still dismissed in some way and why. And then I'm gonna do the same with rewilding. So I want folks to keep in mind that throughout this, I'm gonna be focusing on the normative one, that is the ethical motivations or principles for uh, within these disciplines. And I'm gonna be illustrating those with some examples in practice. And I'm gonna finish by suggesting that incorporating compassion and, and respect for non-humans and their values uh, is integral for moving forward with conservation and rewilding policies. So let's start by simply getting on the same page about who animals are and what they value. And I think this is a critical reminder that in conservation and rewilding, we are dealing with other beings that have cognitive, emotional, and social capabilities that come with their own claims on us. I also suggest this is a type of approach that should be followed in all conservation and wildlife management. So we simply start by acknowledging the existence, the autonomy, and capabilities of those individuals that we are interacting with or looking to interact with or intervene on in some way. So what are those capabilities? Well, you know, as sentient, aware and social animals ourselves, we know, or we should know 
what other beings, other social sentient aware beings are capable of. And we have known this for millennia, basically. All our interactions historically with non-human animals uh, until very recently have been predicated on us knowing that they have these capabilities. And of course, an inhuman inner relationship with another non-human animal is going to acknowledge their agency, their autonomy, their feelings, and their cognition. But now, our best available science also confirms this. So we know that animals are generally, we, we know we are animals, and as animals, you know, and all animals share many of the chemical, biological, anatomical, and to some extent cognitive and emotional structures that allow for the sharing of basic internal capabilities, such as those related to experiencing any emotion like joy, stress, but also more complicated ones like sociability, like wanting freedom from harm or autonomy, like wanting to live and flourish. So dismissing this sharing of biology, of cognition, of emotion, is tantamount to ignoring zoology and maybe even generally biology, including evolutionary theory. Now, it's logical, but hardly ever acknowledge that all those capabilities mean that animals have their own claims to life and well-being. And if they are social beings, they're also gonna care for their kin and for their friends. So scientific fields like ethology and neuroscience have affirmed also these social interests and claims as well. Now, beyond human shape, right, we know that uh, the more we study animals, the more commonality we find. And the imagined sort of marks of human distinction that we've kind of turned into marks of superiority keep getting eroded more and more. And I'm talking about marks here like friendship, like love, like culture, morality, even knowledge of death and ritual. So it's kind of like Darwin said, right? Our differences with animals as animals ourselves are in degree and not in kind. So that all the evidence we have indicates that animals don't want to be harmed, harassed or killed and doing so deserves and demands robust justification. Now that justification, if it's any justification at all, needs to be ethical. It cannot be scientific because science simply doesn't justify. It simply informs. Now, to these capabilities, autonomy, and interests that I mentioned, we have to add that animals are also indispensable parts of society and nature. Our allegedly human civilization has actually been built instead in relationships with all these other beings. And these are relationships that sort of like run the spectrum from care to exploitation. And again, given their interest, the non-human interest and what we obtain from animals from food to labor to companionship is not free of any moral weight. We need to reckon with that. Now, it's not only the contributions to, you know, quote unquote, human society, animals are also integral to all these ecological processes that allow nature to flourish. And they carry these out simply through their agency, through their autonomy and the interactions that they're, they form a part of. So here, of course, I'm referring to processes like pollination, like seed dispersal and predation that are mediated through these animals. So that means, that humans are inevitably embedded in a diversity of relationships with animals. And these relationships are not only ecological, they're social as well. And they highlight, since they're both social and ecological, they highlight the lack of this purely human community that is basically an anthropocentric, a Western almost fiction. And instead, they point to the existence of what philosopher Mary Mitchley calls a mixed moral community, which is instead a multi-species community that has overlapping social and ecological relationships. And of course, all relationships should come with responsibilities. And yet, against all this knowledge, all the best available scholarly evidence on this topic on animals, their capabilities, what they contribute, uh, 
nowhere in current wildlife management or even institutionalized conservation policy do you see appropriate considerations for these beings or their claims. And I would argue that this exposes untrustworthy scientific expertise in our agencies and has its roots in invidious worldviews and ethics as well that we will get into. So to get into why this is the case, we need to dive a bit deeper into the ethical foundations of conservation. So starting with conservation, conservation biology is largely a Western practice that's, that was developed in response to human impacts in nature that were perceived as harmful to both biological diversity and human interests. Now, the focus of concern in both science and practice has been on the long-term viability, the restoration, the health on site of so-called native ecological wholes, such as native species, populations, and ecosystems. That means that conservation is first and foremost ethical. It is science, ecological science, at the service of ethical postulates that are concerned with biological diversity and human interest. A very important piece to touch on here and that explains this is conservation is Michael Soule's seminal What is Conservation Biology article that was published in 1985. Now that same focus on intervening in nature to mitigate harm, to mitigate biodiversity loss, means that conservation is a more clinical than theoretical field. So it's more like to clinical medicine where you have a theoretical component, but what you want is clinic, clinical application of, those, of that theory. And Sule describes it in that way in the article. And he also describes conservation as a crisis discipline and sort of characterizes the relationship between conservation biology and ecology as, and I'm quoting here, analogous to that of surgery to physiology and war to political science. And those are two sort of analogies that are very, very powerful for a number of reasons. We can sort of discuss more on that later. But since its beginnings, beginnings then the field of conservation has been in this model over the place of individual non-human animals within the discipline. And here some people are always like, well, you know, what do you mean? It's animals and conservation, you know, animals are everywhere in nature. So how come you can be a conservationist and not consider uh, individual animals? But again, that's what we're trying to figure out here. Ethically, it's a very different story. And it's a story that I sort of realized when I came into conservation uh, within the last decade. So, but, you know, continuing on, in his article, Sule observes first that the more than human world was being ravaged because it was treated as a mere commodity, you know, and this was sort of a, one of the underlying motivations for him to write this. And he not only reject this exploitative view, he opposed the dualistic rationale that underpinned that lack of care. And he also made calls to respect the inherent value of non-human life. So, and you know, that's a big deal for um, that point in time. He also presupposed the intrinsic value, so the value for itself of native biological diversity. And that's an important concept that sort of like goes together, native biological diversity. And he did it basing himself on the evolutionary ecological inheritance that today's biodiversity represents. But he not only presupposes this value of for Soule in that article, intrinsic value of species, of species diversity, becomes the most fundamental postulate of conservation biology. So that intrinsic value residing in native species is the most present concern and overrules almost all others for him in that particular paper. Now, He's not the only one that has taken this stance. Other env environmental ethicists, Sule wasn't an ethicist, he was a conservation scientist, but environmental ethicists as well have focused on developing or interpreting arguments for protecting these native ecological holes. And in the process, 
have largely dismissed engagement with non-human beings and their values until very recently. So environmental ethics, ethicists, for example, and I have an example of a paper there by Baird Calicut, uh, they developed the notion of ecocentric holism that considers nature's intrinsic value, especially a particular interpretation of Aldo Leopold's statement that, and I quote, I think is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community, it is wrong when it tends otherwise, end quote. So ecocentric holism essentially rests on two pillars here. First, that nature has intrinsic value, and this value lies in native ecological holes, for example, species ecosystems, rather than individual beings. Now, importantly, the second pillar, this idea that the value lies in native ecological holes rather than individual beings, presupposes an established hierarchy of value that subordinates individual animals to these native ecological holes. And that implies that animals are regarded as worthy of moral consideration only by virtue of their ecological relationships and are in themselves secondary to the concern for holes. Now, in addition to focusing on native species diversity, the postulates of conservation biology in Soleil's article also generally subordinate individual animals to human instrumental and ecological values. And an, a good example here is that in that article, Soleil suggests that ethical concerns for individual animals and conserving biological diversity should remain ethically and politically separate. And, you know, this wasn't, uh, from a lack of compassion for individual animals, but it was an embrace of these, of this ecocentrist holist, this ecosystem focused interpretation of intrinsic value as a guiding principle, which must with much less ethical attention paid to individual animals in conservation. Now, Nonetheless, the consequence that we see today is that conservation biology and its ethics remain ambivalent and almost as relativistic as the general population about whether we have responsibilities towards individual non-human beings and how we should meet those responsibilities. And that disjointed ethic allows for compromises that place such a high value on most current and increasingly trivial human interest from destructive activities that the needs and the interest of non-human individuals and much of nature going beyond individuals are effectively dismissed from the calculus. So my colleagues and I termed this sort of ethical position as the position of traditional or orthodox conservation. Now, You'll know that there are a few problems with this line of reasoning, especially when applied uncritically. So starting off with, I started with who animals are and what they value. And so the first and huge problem is that if we start from there, there are so many sources of value that either Soule's normative postulates or environmental philosophers have considered. And in fact, they're not even mentioned these values. So we know, again, including through best available science more recently, that animals are more than components of ecological community. They are individual selves that participate and conform ecological communities and social communities that forge and, nur and nurture relationships and effective bonds with other animals. You know, they care for each other, they empathize, they have personalities and preferences, for example. And if we take them as groups, then they have their own preferred and developed cultures. They have their own social norms, morality, and social organization. And the point I wanna make here by naming all these uh, values is that each of these features is intrinsically valuable as well, despite being a non-human value. And that means that they should be considered equitably, but are instead ignored in conservation. So when, for example, when we kill a wolf, intrinsic value is obviously destroyed um, because of 
that wolf's life, that wolf's well-being, but also the relationships that that wolf had with other wolves and potentially other species, who knows? But this also happens when we kill a deer, a trout, a mouse, or a spider. You know, they are social, if they are social beings, also we need to account for these effective bonds and the bonds that those individuals value and the other holders of these bonds that are also being harmed. Because again, these are all intrinsically valuable forms of flourishing and we need to start considering them as such. But this leads to another issue, the fact that all these sources of non-human value are dismissed. And the issue here is that if we acknowledge these non-human sources of intrinsic value, then the question and a critical one here becomes conceding that species diversity, right? Which is what has been focused on also has intrinsic value. Why is it more fundament fundamental? Why does it override all these other sources of non-human value? And not only overrides, but to the extent that it allows for the destruction, that it's used as a justification for the destruction of all these other sources of value. And to my knowledge, no one has even, has even or ever addressed that question. It seems a critical question when that is what we're doing a lot of the time within conservation. So without addressing this, this question, right? This moral hierarchy of orthodox conservation ethics of enshrining native species diversity over non-human values is then, you know, to put it in more legal terms, arbitrary and capricious, how I have there on that slide, right? because it doesn't have a well-reasoned explanation. It's presupposed. So it generally highlights one preferred aspect of the natural world, native species diversity for ethical consideration and primacy while the rest of non-human values become simply subservient to it. And that's basically the case with individuals that argue for this moral hierarchy of ecological collectives over individual beings, but also of native, native biodiversity over introduced species, you know, be them introduced feral domestic animals. And many conservationists in fact argue this by assertion a lot of the time. So they invoke Soleil's article to just one-sidedly resolve any ethical dispute. It's like species, native species diversity has intrinsic value, that's why we're doing this. And so in that way, when we use it in that way, intrinsic value of these of native species becomes this dogmatic belief instead of a living concept that you can use for ethical reflection, for ethical deliberation and for action. So, added to this general, general utilitarianism and commodification of animals in the 20th century, this type of conservation ethic then snowballs into these pre-commitments to viewing animals in terms of collectivism, instrumentalism, and nativism. And these are sort of um, uh, features that have been criticized by compassionate conservations. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on, but then all these Commitments are also encouraged by a consequentialism that justifies virtually any conservation action for biodiversity as serving the greater good, of course, from a human perspective. And we see this in conservation a lot, for example, in calls for killing feral cats, horses, and other feral animals because they're allegedly endangering nature and other species. We see it in the hesitancy to challenge domestic animal exploitation, you know, and uh, including industrial animal agriculture. We see it in the acceptance of trophy hunting, or even the acceptance of here in the US with wolves killing for tolerance. Uh, this idea that folks are gonna be more tolerant of wolves if you allow them to kill them. And, um, you know, more or less, we also see it even through interventions such as intervening and sterilizing coyotes, for example, to reduce hybridization with wet wolves because the coyotes don't have an interest in being sterilized. They have an interest in reproducing and living their lives as they see fit. So, 
this dismissal of individual non-human values and claims within orthodox conservation is seemingly almost absolute. Um, now, myself and as well as many conservationists, you know, academics from multiple fields as well, including animal studies, ethologists, um, ethicists, and philosophers, have argued that the reason for this sort of brutal, almost absolute dismissal comes down to uh, the worldview of anthropo anthropocentrism. And for that particular concept, I like to use Matthew Calarco's definition, philosopher Matthew Calarco's. I have, I added his book right there, great book, he, uh, both of those. So Calarco's definition of anthropocentrism is, and I'm quoting, the privileging of that class of beings who best fulfill a conception of what is considered to be quintessentially human over and against all others. So it is a prejudice against those who deviate from the paradigmatic ideal of the human, which in modern history has meant an allegedly fully independent, able, rational, white, heterosexual, meat-eating male. So beings that don't fulfill that ideal are devalued, are different, devalued, dismissed, human and non-human, despite having the same claims to life and well-being. Though some academics like uh, Afco and Claire Jean Kim have laid out deep connections between anti-animal sentiments and racist ide ideologies like white supremacy that converge with this explanation of anthropocentrism. So if we look at it from that perspective, we prejudice against animals and what they value using the same logic as those who prejudice against other humans. We devalue them based on superficial differences. And that means that the ethical worldviews that are dominating conservation are rooted in a human exceptionalism based on an ideal of the human that dismisses not only non-human life, but other humans as well. Again, you see this in conservation a lot. You see this in conservation in the US when the US Fish and Wildlife Service neglects to engage properly with uh, Native American tribes, despite knowing the cultural and spiritual significance of uh, wolves as their brothers, for example. We see it internationally when commu marginalized communities, indigenous communities are displaced because a new protected area needs to be placed on their historical ancestral territory simply because there are X or Y species is being endangered. Now, more recently, moving on from that, a uh, friend and colleague and I, Paulo Castello, have argued that this dismissal is not only due to, to anthropocentrism, but that it combines with an assumed human sovereignty over animals. And on this, we're following the argument developed by post-colonial scholar Dinesh Waterwell, which I have uh, the book, his book, The War Against Animals, right there. So human sovereignty here refers to the self-assumed right to intervene in the lives of individual animals. So conservation basically has been founded with this assumed prerogative that assumes first that we have the right to decide who lives and who dies. And second, that killing animals is not really a violation of an animal's right to life because our legitimacy, the legitimacy to kill flows from and this is how Dinesh Waterwell puts it, our, and I'm quoting, our human right to decide because we believe ourselves and our violence to be superior, to be necessary for human fulfillment, or to be giving other entities their due and therefore justifiable. You see this a lot in conservation with uh, invasive species. In fact, the concept of invasive is already militarized sort of building on the argument of that this is a war against these species. And what's more, the idea itself, right, that we have the right to decide about animal lives is violent itself, even before any physical harm is done because it, oppo it oppresses, it instrumentalizes, and it dismisses. A good example of this is how a recent study by um, environmental um, social scientists in Australia uh, found that the um, identification of certain species 
as invasive as pests, etc., cetera, uh, increased the uh, public's uh, sort of uh, approval of lethal interventions and harmful interventions against those animals. So again, violence through concepts, through the terms of pest invasive being done already, even before physical violence uh, starts. So to the extent that no non-human values are explicitly and equitably considered within institutionalized traditional conservation, this human sovereignty is basically can be assumed across the board. And again, no one to my knowledge has provided convincing arguments for upholding it. So it is another unfounded belief that we have this self-assumed right. Now, to these misunderstandings of ethics within conservation, we'll add some that have to do with science, but that relate to ethics. So first one is that science informs, but is secondary to the worldviews and values that initially motivate that science. So worldviews and ethics. Worldviews being what you think your place in the world is. Ethics is what, um, what you think or how you think you should behave towards other beings. Those two, really still decide what questions will be asked and what will be considered as relevant data by science. So it means that science is a tool at the service of the worldviews and the ethics that motivate it. And just like any tool, if the worldviews and ethics are bad, then the science can be employed for bad as well. Now, a second misunderstanding of science is that, and this is an argument that was developed by philosopher Freya Matthews, is that conservation biology's scientific way of knowing, conservation's a scientific epistemology about the world, leads the field into an emotion-free stance towards other beings. And I'll quote Matthews here. She states that, I'm quoting, it is paramount that no relationship of an effective kind, whether positive or negative, be allowed to intrude into the inquiry, since affect with respect to the object may sway one's findings. So what she's saying here is that this allegedly scientific worldview may seem objective or neutral, but it actually works to detach the observer from the rest of the natural world. So that works to deny essentially phenomenologically the subjectivity of nature. The fact that there are, again, non-human perspectives and values out there, and instead it encourages the dismissal of non-human values. But, right, and here we're getting to sort of, you know, solutions to this, despite all these common misunderstandings of ethics and science, non-human values are finding their way to conservation from within, both within and outside the discipline. And of these, compassionate conservation seems the most uh, popular reason example. So compassionate conservation basically emerged as a framework to challenge conservation's value orthodoxy by promoting ethical concern for individual non-humans and enshrining their importance of individual uh, non-humans within conservation. So compassion conservationists have critiqued the instrumentalism, the collectivism, the nativism that's inherent in conservation, but it has also motivated increased consideration of non-human suffering, which has generally led to more inclusive, more robust ethical evaluations of conservation interventions so as, first, so as to first do no harm, as one of their principles states. And in fact, some compassionate conservationists, um, myself included, have at least affirmed non-human personhood, which recognizes sentient individuals as persons. And we'll get uh, a little bit later on about why that is so important. Now, also from within the discipline, there is increasing engagement, engagement with an eco-feminist ethics of care. And uh, I particularly like this framework because it ties together care, compassion, dignity, and respect. And it really also ties well with multi-species justice, which we'll talk about in a second. But starting from an ethic of care, for an ethic of care, compassion is morally basic. So compassion is fundamental 
to the way we relate to others, which places an emphasis on valuing effective relationships and on individuals as relational, vulnerable, different, dependent, and embodied beings. But it also affirms the dignity of those differences. And not only those differences, but also those relationships and dependency. And in doing so, it affirms their own human values within them as well. So in, in my work and in my research, I tend to tie compassion and conservation, ecofeminist nature ethics with multi-species justice through these concepts of respect and dignity. And I do so because an ethic of care right, that's promoted by ecofeminism acknowledges basically the dignity of otherness and of differences. Now, dignity means that those others are worthy of respect. And respect means that we have due regard or should have due regard, you know, uh, for adequate consideration for their claims. And these concepts then respect and dignity, which are intimately tied to each other, are also intimately tied to justice because justice concerns what we owe to and are owed by others in our multi-species community. And a just process and outcome should uphold the dignity and respect of everyone. So justice is also generally tied to persons and personhood because personhood implies that you should not be considered a means to an end. So promoting justice implies that a, in, in promoting justice entails a fair balancing of the claims of human and non-humans in our mixed moral community, rather than the dismissal of the urgent claims of animals to life, to well-being, to autonomy, in favor of just any human claims, you know, including minor comforts or enjoyments, from recreation all the way to food. So, you know, the point here being that justice can and ought to apply to our relationships with non-human beings. And we should reckon with that. And that reckoning demands that we give up the comforts that have been derived from animal exploitation. So now we come to Rewilder, right? And within conservation, we also have rewilding practices or interventions. And the term itself, you know, in recent decades, in the past, past two decades, uh, probably has exploded in popularity with a variety of meanings and practices that are involved in this. So it's a little bit of a, you know, it's, it's a pluralistic exercise, but you can get pretty lost in what it includes or what it doesn't. Um, so let's try, I'm going to try to give a, a brief overview of what's included and then the place of non-human values within it. So the term rewilding first emerged from a collaboration between Michael Soule and, and the late environmental activist Dave, David Foreman in the late 1980s. And at the time it focused on the large scale, large scale restoration of natural ecosystems and especially restoring wilderness and wildlands across North America. And, you know, its most famous iteration basically was that of the three C's, corridor, cores, corridors, and carnivores. And although it's taken many forms, it can be generally conceived as a way to restore ecological function to an ecosystem. And it, this could be done by taxonomic replacement, you know, with extant or extinct megafauna, or even through ecologically equivalent non-natives. So it's a lot about function. But I wanna focus on the normative motivations for rewilding because this is as normative a practice as conservation. It is first ethical. And as expected, we find some motivations limited to these ecocentric ones, uh, exclusive for species or ecosystems. But we also find motivations that converge with non-human values. And you know, as an example, in my latest blog, I mentioned deep ecologist philosopher Arnie Nace. And his, I cite him when he states that, and I'm quoting, every living being should have an equal right to live and flourish, uh, end quote. And that diversity implies self-determination so that 
this should lead to the sort of conclusion that human destructive lifestyles should be precluded because you need nature to be to have some autonomy for it to flourish. Now, Arninez also suggests self-determination is inherent in nature and diversity of life flourishes when we respect the autonomy of non-human individuals and communities rather than we, when we restrict it and bend it to our will. But also more recently, there's mention of motivations such as releasing natural processes from human control, dominance or suppression, more non-human autonomy, calls for full integration of nature and society that converge with a mixed community of species. And there have even been added seeds like compassion, which was added most notably by Mark Beckoff and coexistence, which uh, was added and promoted by John Davis from the Wilding Institute. So it almost seems like these developments, new developments that are calling, we're seeing non-human autonomy, we're seeing compassion, we're seeing coexistence. These developments seem to be increasing, the same increasing concerns we see over animal dismissal in traditional conservation with an added respect to non-human agency and values and what it can do for conservation. Again, sort of putting a finer point on this is still a conservation um, practice. So we're experiencing an increasing push to consider non-human values within rewilding simultaneously with conservation. And arguably the push towards consideration within conservation has catalyzed that push and that emphasis within rewilding. So, this, of course, is not to say that rewilding considers animals adequate, but the underlying motivations to respect non-human individuals are latent there. And that needs to be highlighted and foregrounded much, much more, like ethicist William Lynn suggests. Uh, for example, we could work to combine the motivation, these motivations for rewilding with the above frameworks that we mentioned with an ethic of care a stance against anthropocentrism, a stance against human sovereignty over animals. And, you know, a, a good point to make here is that, you know, we don't need to hold to what in 1985 or what uh, articles and ethicists said in 1985. For example, many conservationists here know that Leopold changed his stance on predators from killing a wolf to protecting predators, but, you know, relative to Sule, a lot of conservationists don't really know how Sule in, in the last years of his life emphasized love and effective connection for individual non-humans to, as a way to invigorate conservation to the extent that he says, you, that he stated, you only protect what you love, right? So we can add to this, to all this that, you know, as deep ecologist, writer and activist, Gary Snyder states, wildness is the world basically. And this has two critical implications. One that we can rewild from anywhere because wildness is all around us. So not just out there in the wilderness, you know, and, and uh, places where people aren't or with large carnivals. So to rewild, we could fight, yes, fight to prepare, protect wolves, to protect cougars, to, pro to protect wilderness areas from unjustified exploitation, but also fight to protect coyotes, to protect crows, raccoons, feral cats, all the other animals that suffer so much cruelty and loss of loved ones in life, and generally simply because they're more numerous than all those that we generally, that ecocentric holism cares about. Now, a second point with this wellness is the world word, a statement by Gary Snyder, is that we need to begin with the ethics of it by internalizing the appropriate values and by rewilding ourselves. So to basically conclude, I'll suggest rewilding could be conceived normatively as allowing for beings, human and non-humans, to thrive in all their diversity without imposing on them an arbitrary dismissive human value or will, including through categories like nativeness or domesticity. 
And here, one of my favorite definitions of rewilding by scientists Liv Baker and Rebecca Winkler is one of the most brief but comprehensive in my view. And they simply define it as, and I quote, to restore autonomous beings to the landscape. I think that encapsulates care and respect for non-human life, well-being, and ages. Now, we also need to incorporate multi-species justice by equitably balancing human and non-human claims, starting with foregrounding the beings that are most vulnerable and whose claims are more urgent. And that basically means all animals, maybe most animals, uh, and maybe especially the most numerous ones, those, for example, so-called fur bearers, right? Like coyotes, like raccoons that have year-round open seasons and no back limits that are um, victims of wildlife killing contests. Now, you know, of course, wildness and rewilding requires us to restrain human will and stop destructive practices. Um, because as Ernie Nays mentions, the absolute highest level of self-realization cannot be reached by anybody without all others also reaching that level. So this means you know, stopping destructive practices, appropriating less land, and not just out there in the wilderness. You know, we should also be able to share space like urban areas with coyotes and other wildlife by considering their needs and when, when it's necessary to prioritize their needs instead of ours, instead of human needs. And it also means sharing risk instead of desiring sort of a sanitized wild, you know, and putting all risk of harm and death on animals. It's like, oh, I'd like, I'd like to hear coyotes, but I don't want them in my yard. Oh, I like to hear coyotes, but I don't, wanna, I don't want any risk from them. That doesn't seem like coexistence or even respect for differences, you know? And if we don't do this, then where is the fairness here? When we're putting all the, all the, the sort of harm, right? And the burden on animals. So essentially, if right, wildness is the world, then rewilding is going to require humans to respect non-human beings. It's going to require us to, to restrain human will, to stop destructive practices, even traditional ones, if conditions no longer justify them. And it's going to require, right, through concepts like anthropocentrism, through concepts like human sovereignty, it's going to require through uh, frameworks like ecofeminism, it's going to require intersectionality so that our entire community of life can actually flourish. So with that, I'm going to leave it there. I think we have time for questions. So thank you so much. And I hope you enjoyed that.